What fun. It's awesome to be here. What an honor. I tell you what. Wow. Listen, you know, I have felt so fortunate over the last 20 years to have the opportunity to work with some of the best athletes and coaches in the world. It's been fascinating. And I've always been so interested in how they do what they do and how they do it at such a high level consistently day after day after day. And what I believe is that us, wherever we may be in our lives, wherever we may be in this wonderful world, have so much that we can learn from these athletes and coaches that execute so consistently at a high level. So I think there's sort of five things that I want to sort of walk through that I think are paramount in sort of shifting your behavior in the absence of crisis. So in other words, we hear the word potential so much, right? People talk about potential. Well, why do these athletes so often reach that potential? How do they maximize it? And how do we take those processes that they capture each and every day and insert that into our own lives to improve what we do and how we do it? So I think at the most basic level, we have to believe in what we do and why we do it, right? So one of the guys that I've worked with for years is an unbelievable guy, John Smoltz. John Smoltz is a guy that I believe certainly believes in his ability to execute as a pitcher. John was a pitcher in the big leagues, pitched for the Braves for years, a right-handed pitcher, and had great success. Well, for 10 of the 14 years that the Atlanta Braves went to the division series, John was a really big part of that process. And he was a starting pitcher, so he would come out at the beginning of games, right, every four or five days, and he would pitch, and he would start, and he would throw 80 or 90 pitches, right? And then four or five days later, he would do it again. John won Cy Youngs. He had incredible success and was a part of the Braves' success. Then in about 2001, he struggled and had Tommy John surgery and had some, some issues physically. But then in 2000, late in 2001, the organization came to us and to him and said, hey, listen, you know what? He's an unbelievable star. He has, he's had great success, but we don't have a guy inside of our organization right now that we want to close for us. So we don't have a guy that can come in, right, in the eighth or ninth inning and finish the games for us. And we feel like John can step up and do that role. Well, nobody believed that he could because John had had a lot of injuries. He'd had, he dealt with some issues. But John at the core believed that he could. Writers and folks in the media were saying, boy, I don't know if this guy can actually handle this transition physically, mentally. It's a whole different deal. And that, in many ways, was what motivated John to want to do it. John said, you know what? Everybody doesn't think I can do this, but I know I can close, Mal. So he accepted the opportunity to be the closer. And in, in that very year, he came out and won 55, closed 55 games, had 55 saves. Unbelievable. Set a new NL record. So not only was he a Cy Young winner as a starter, but he also set records as a closer as well. But what it was, was John didn't let the negative influences from the world, from the media, from anything else come into his mind and tell him, you can't make this change. You can't make this change from being a marathon runner, right, to a sprinter. But he could and he believed he could. So I think when we think about unleashing our potential, when we think about maximizing our abilities in our own lives, the first step in that process is to send ourselves the right messages, right? To send ourselves messages that allow us to believe that we can, in fact, execute at the highest level, that we have that potential. The second thing that I think is paramount is our ability to ensure that we discover who we are and the gaps in the world in which we live and how, in fact, we can actually potentially close those gaps for, for ourselves personally and for the world that we live in to add value. So I'll give you an example, kind of a personal story. In 1993, I graduated from Michigan State. And I had this passion to be in the business of sports. But like most of us, right, at 21 or 22, we're not sure quite what that might look like. But I got my Honda Accord in Lansing, Michigan, where I grew up in a wonderful family. And I packed up my Honda Accord. And I had about 2,000 bucks in my back pocket because my folks were kind enough to let me live at home after I'd graduated for a few months and teach tennis at a little park nearby. So I taught tennis, made two grand, put it in my back pocket, and drove to Atlanta without a job. And my college coach from Michigan State, I played tennis there, was kind enough to give me three names of three coaches that she said would be able to help me. And I had this philosophy at 21 or 22 that if you ask for advice, you get a job. And if you ask for a job, you get advice, right? <laughs> I think the same thing's true in business, right? If you ask for the business, sometimes you just get advice. <laughs> and if you ask for advice, sometimes you get the business. So I get in my car, I drive down to Atlanta, and my parents thought, well, this will be about two, two, three weeks top. She'll be back driving north on 75 back home to come back and live with us and find a job here. Well, I got down to Atlanta, and I woke up, and one of my friends from high school was kind enough to let me live on the floor of her apartment. 
for a couple weeks until I could find a place to live and get a job and, and sort of start tapping into my two grand, which I didn't want to tap into too quick, right? So I get up that first morning, and this is before cell phones, so I'm exposing my age a little bit, but I get up and I call from the landline there at the, you know, at the little apartment, and I call this one pro who my coach had given me the name of. And I said, hey, listen, I played tennis at Michigan State. You know, I want to teach tennis, and I'm trying to kind of get you know, into my space in Atlanta. I want to be in the sports marketing business, but I'm thinking, you know, maybe you might have some nice people in Atlanta that'd be kind enough to give me some advice because I really want to pursue my passion of sports. And he said, wow, you know, that's interesting. And we got to chatting for a minute, and he said, you know, you may not know this, but in Atlanta, you can teach tennis in exchange for your rent. And I said, wow, man, I got to get one of those deals, right? That sounds like a sweet situation. I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, people teach tennis at apartment complexes in exchange or for a reduced rate on their rent. And he said, in fact, there's this property, great location in Atlanta where the pro is actually leaving. He's been teaching at the property for a long time, but he's actually leaving the property. And I don't even think he's told the manager yet. And I said, you got to be kidding me. Where is this place, right? I got to go over there. So I get in my car, I drive over to this place, and I walk in and I said, hey, how are you? I played tennis in college. You know, I see you have a court. I wondered if by any chance, you know, I could talk to you about teaching tennis to your residents. And she said, oh, wow, I appreciate you stopping by. You know, we have a pro and he's amazing. He's doing a great job, you know, and we've had him forever and we're good. And you know when you're like 21, how you go to Kinko's or wherever and you make your little business cards and, and they're super bootleg, right? And they're sort of paper thin, but you're so pumped because you actually have a business card now. <laughs> So I had my business card that I had made, right, that had nothing on it but my name. And I walk in and I said, well, hey, I said, here's my card and why don't you keep this? And if anything changes, you know, let me know and, and we can stay connected. And she said, oh, yeah, I appreciate it. But, you know, like I said, he's been here. He's awesome. I said, great. So I drive out. I drive across the street and I see this little pizza place called Perro's Pizza. And I see this little place and I thought to myself, man, I wonder if that place sells a lot of pizza to that apartment complex because, boy, they should. You know, a bunch of folks, 21 years old, 22, whatever it is, they'd probably love a $15 dinner and it's right across the street. So the best way to figure that out, right, is just go over to this pizza place. So I walk in and I said, hi, is uh, Mr. Perro there? Thinking that was a pretty good guess, right? Mr. Perro is Mr. Perro here. And they said, oh, as a matter of fact, he is. She said, just a minute, is everything okay? I said, yeah, no, I just had a quick question for him. So out walks this guy in all black. He'd been back there throwing dough, making pizzas, right? And he comes walking out, and I said, hey, I said, Mr. Perry. He said, yes. I said, can I just ask you a quick question? He said, sure. I said, do you sell a lot of pizza to that apartment complex across the street? Because it feels like you should. I mean, they're right there, man. And he goes, you know, that's a, that's a great point. He said, you know, we sell a little bit. And he's sort of looking around at the folks in there, kind of getting hot. You know, like, why don't we sell a lot of pizza <laughs> to that apartment complex? And I said, yeah, I mean, it feels like you should. And he said, no question. And I said, well, listen, what if we work something out where, like, you gave me 15, 20 free pizzas a month, and I gave them to the apartment complex to all the residents at the tennis clinic, and we could maybe put a little coupon from Perro's Pizza in the newsletter that the residents get at the first of every month, you know, and you just give me the free pizzas. And he said, wow. He said, so 15, 20 free pizzas a month, and you'll put a little coupon in the newsletter that the residents get? I said, exactly. He goes, done. I love it. I said, okay, but listen, man, I don't have the deal yet. <laughs> but when I get it, I'll be back and we'll work it out. And he goes, love it, let me know. So I go back over to my friend's apartment and I pick up the phone and I call my buddies at Wilson Sporting Goods that gave me rackets when I played in college. And I said, hey, can I, can I ask you a huge favor? I said, listen, would you hook me up and like send me a box of like tennis rackets, you know, keychains, water bottles, t-shirts, I mean, just anything, good stuff. I'm trying to get this deal to teach tennis for a reduced rate on my rent. And he goes, wow, Molly. He said, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd, I'll do that for you. I'd be happy to. And I said, okay, great, but like I need it tomorrow. <laughs> so he goes, done. So I get this box the next day. And meanwhile, I run over to Kinko's actually again. And, and I print off these little articles that I'd written in, the, in this little paper in Lansing, you know, on how to hit a forehand and a backhand like little tennis steps. So I print that off, like 15 of them, because I'm thinking these would be really cool to put in the newsletter to all the residents, right? So I'm thinking I've got to wait a couple days because I've got to make sure, right, that the pro has told the lady. Because you know how you only have so many shots to walk back in before somebody sort of politely escorts you out <laughs> of, of that place, right? So I wait about a day or so, and then I go back over to the property, and I said, hey, how are you? You know, I'm Molly. I play tennis. And she goes, oh, my gosh, I am so glad you're back. She said, it's unbelievable. She said, I couldn't find your card. She said, but our pro came in, and he's leaving the property. I go, no. 
like, you got to be joking me. This is incredible. He goes, yeah. He said, it's incredible timing. This is amazing. I said, unbelievable. I said, well, you know, I was actually just coming by to bring you this box of stuff because I called my buddies at Wilson and I tell her about these little articles that I'd written. I said, and by the way, you know, I talked to this pizza place across the street. I said, they're going to give us free pizza to give to all the residents. And she goes, well, this is fantastic. And I said, well, how did it work with a pro? You know, what was the deal? And she said, he just taught.